Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone. I am Shrija Agrawal and you are watching our series Men Spinning with Anti-Fragility. Today's session is on the theme Move Over Stakeholder Capitalism. It talks about really stakeholder primacy. But before we get into the panel discussion, let's do some context setting on the same. What should a corporate purpose be? This question is not necessarily a new one and actually has been debated for decades now. In fact, renowned free market economist Milton Friedman once opined that the sole purpose of a corporation is to provide profit for the owners and shareholders. Individuals and groups like labor and the workforce should be rewarded by being paid for their work, but he also posited that their needs were subservient to the needs of the shareholders and owners. This was the dominating idea. Every decision made by a corporation must be driven by the need to optimize profits and enterprises should not be burdened with the responsibility of achieving social goals because there would be an invisible hand that would benefit the community. Now, this was the shareholder primacy model and it had a monopoly on the minds of investors and corporations. No longer though, in recent years, the idea of stakeholder capitalism has received more recognition, as well as the idea that there ought to be long-term value created in an enterprise. The definition of stakeholder capitalism has evolved to basically mean that organizations can go beyond providing returns for shareholders, but also be mindful what the ecological and social impact is, and also take care of various stakeholders in the organization. This form of capitalism includes cultivating long-term supplier relationships, embracing sustainable practices, paying their fair share of taxes, creating secure jobs for employees, and reducing their carbon footprint. Despite the harrowing impacts of COVID-19, these ideas have continued to persist. There has been a massive push and evolution to potentially make capitalism more inclusive and purposeful. Environmental, social, and governance reporting analysis can furnish valuable insights and help create long-term value for stakeholders, positively impact the financial metrics of a company, and better inform investment decisions. Disseminating data regarding the organization's operations in three areas, environmental, social, and corporate governance provide a snapshot of the business's impact for investors. This analysis summarizes quantitative and qualitative disclosures and helps screen investments. But beyond traditional financial metrics, when did investors really start caring about these new parameters? Institutional investors are now aligning portfolios based on how an enterprise's ESG performance is. They are of the opinion that companies that have a great ESG performance are better ready for the long term, less risky, and better prepared for uncertainty and volatility which makes such companies truly anti-fragile. Once on the sideline, governance and CSR have been brought to the center of the boardroom table and are instrumental in acquiring higher margins and more profitability. When supply chains are organic, products are ESG compliant, and the workforce is taken care of, consumers and investors positively respond to them. Hence, such organizations may have a competitive advantage over those who operate traditionally. Climate change, human rights, diversity, and equality are being looked at more closely by corporations because they know that the world is watching. Sure, it's a pandemic and companies have been massively affected. And while their flight or fight responses has put them in survival mode, ESG issues are now considered integral to how resilient a company is. With the world on fire, there's time to be forearmed as the fight is already here. The need for a sustainable future, behavioral changes, and reduction in carbon emissions are paramount and organizations know it. Those that do not recognize it have lost the trust of their customers and not done too well. Can multi-stakeholder considerations build sustainable business models with stakeholder capitalism? But SEBI's business responsibility and sustainability report standards to soon be mandatory from 2022 for top companies, how will investment decisions evolve? Will ESG performance be a critical focus post COVID-19? With COVID-19 reinforcing the imperative, what is the future of stakeholder capitalism in a post-pandemic investing landscape? 
To break it all down, please help me welcome Amarjeet Singh, Executive Director SEBI, GN Gupta, Co-Founder, Managing Director, Stakeholder Empowerment Service, and Sulil Shroff, Managing Partner, Sulil Amarjeet Mangaldas. Uh, for a power-packed panel like this, it would be a great idea to really have opening remarks from each one of our distinguished panelists. I will start with you, Mr. Amarjeet Singh. The first question to you really is that, how do you think stakeholder capitalism can really be gauged, especially since these companies are self-reporting currently? Do you believe there will be a level of disclosure shareholders which they'll be comfortable with? And this shift from BRR, which is business responsibility reporting, to BRSR, which is business responsibility and sustainability reporting, will that be a seamless one? Will the concerns of greenwashing really be addressed? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shrita. And thanks for having me, including me in this panel. I compliment uh, the organizers for organizing this very important discussion on the heels of uh, COP26. So I'll not go into, you know, the, the stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism, the basic debate, which you've already uh, kind of set the context on. So let me focus on the on the state of play in the area of ESG disclosures. And let me do it at two levels, one at the global level, and second, then you know I can talk about uh, what we are doing in our country in this space. So first, you know, there are three very clear uh, global developments or global trends, as you call them, uh, which I would just like to lay them on the table. First is very recent November 3 announcement of formation of a new international sustainability standards board. Um, this was done in, during the COP26 discussions. And uh, this standards board uh, is set to develop a comprehensive global baseline of high quality sustainability disclosure standards. Uh, just to give you a background, the uh, in terms of the uh, disclosure standards globally, there's been a bit of overcrowding and the world has been looking for one common global baseline and this new body is intended to bridge that gap. Uh, that is one. Second is, you know, uh, in the last two years, I would say, especially, we are increasingly witnessing greater push on ESG disclosures from regulators across the world. So as per a FSP study, uh, FSP report, out of 25 member jurisdictions, 14 already have requirements, guidance, or expectations in place, uh, especially for the climate-related disclosures. Third important trend which we've noticed while doing our BRSR work is that regulators uh, so far uh, across the world, they were following uh, typically the comply or explain or voluntary approach. But now we are witnessing a very you know subtle shift or a gradual shift towards mandatory ESG disclosures. And they have given different timelines, different jurisdictions are following uh, different timelines on this. So these are three important global trends. One, setting up of ISSB, Second, more and more push on ESG disclosures coming from various regulators. Third, a shift from voluntary comply or explain to mandatory regimes. Now let me turn to the, uh, you know, our markets, Indian securities market. So uh, we are, you know, also witnessing certain important trends in this area. Uh, sustainable investing is becoming more mainstream and definitely disclosure requirements have to keep pace with the changing trends in sustainable investments. So while as a regulator, SEBI or any other regulator, we may be agnostic to where an investor should invest, but you know we have an important role to play when it comes to the area of ESG disclosures. And second important area where we have to play some role is we have to regulate green washing. Uh, so, you know, let me go back uh, about 10 years back. We were the, one of the jurisdictions which very early on adopted the sustainability reporting for listed entities through a framework called BRR, Business Responsibility Reporting. 
this was a fairly light touch regime and uh, mm. you know uh, this was applicable to begin with only for 100 companies and it was progressively extended to uh, 500 companies in 2015 and by 2019 we had extended this to top 1000 companies uh but number of global developments over the last 4 5 years like your paris agreement on climate change un sdgs our commitment to un sdgs those necessitated at a very high level the review of the drr requirements so we started working on it and uh, in fact a committee was set up by the government of india uh, just to give you a bit of background and sebi was a part of that committee so that committee made recommendations for improving the uh, sustainability disclosure requirements what we picked up from there for the listed space and we had a very comprehensive very intensive stakeholder consultation and we also benchmark ourselves with the reputed international standards and we came out with brsr that is business responsibility and sustainability reporting uh this is a notable departure from brr uh this has brr was more qualitative in nature whereas brsr is has lot of quantifiable matrix and it is uh, outcome oriented uh if i remember correctly we have more than 500 data points as a part of the brsr uh, framework so idea is to provide Uh, a consistent comparable uh, set of data points which one can you know use while uh, while uh, taking a view on the company so uh, there are some nine principles uh, which uh, you know which uh, on which the disclosures are required to be made and these nine principles actually go back to sdgs and they cover both environmental and social aspects such as climate action responsible consumption production gender equality working conditions and so on and the whole framework uh, actually divides the disclosure requirement in two parts one is the essential disclosure requirements and second is the leadership indicators so essential one has no choice one has to make disclosures against essential requirements and leadership indicators are a uh, voluntary in case a company can they should otherwise they are not compelled to uh, disclose against those indicators one important aspect before i stop is that while we were doing brsr we were very very mindful that we don't want to increase the you know uh, uh, increase the burden on the disclosure burden on the companies if the companies are already uh disclosing as per an international standard uh, they would not be forced to adopt brsr as long as the brsr disclosure are covered in that international uh, disclosure uh, standard which they follow so basically what i'm talking about is there is a, a very clear interoperability clause if uh, a company is disclosing as per an acceptable international standard it doesn't have to repeat the disclosures under brsr you can just cross refer and and that will do so maybe you know let me in conclusion as part of the opening remarks say that brsr has taken the sustainability disclosures requirements in india to another level uh, it has raised the game uh, and uh, we are quite excited about it this is for, uh, the the implementation is voluntary this year and it becomes mandatory from the next financial year so let me just pause with that thank you thanks for that mr singh thank you for laying the land for esg reporting the transition from brr to to brsr the reasons for that and you also mentioned three key words if i may use them that what was the rationale behind brsr quantifiable interoperable and you also said the fact that it has actually raised the game and raised the bar for india in esg reporting i'd like to turn to you mr gupta now talking about and taking it further from where mr singh sort of left it would be good idea to also have your opening remarks in this direction on the state of play of regulatory and voluntary compliance you know based on the index you know how does the investor and stakeholder perspective come into the picture here Thank you, Shrija, for inviting me for this important summit, and I am thankful to Hindustan Times also for this. Without wasting time, let me come back to the thing. 
as mr singh said that things are changing very fast in the world based on climate and all other things he said that on 3rd november a new organization had been formed and if you recall just few months before sasb and iirc had merged to found a vrf foundation voluntary foundation so things are changing very fast the idea behind all these changes is that somehow it was experienced that everybody was trying to play its own music which was becoming some sort of a cacophony everybody was having a standard everybody was having a disclosure so word has come that time has come where we should move in one direction so hopefully in another 6 months or one year's time everybody will be merging towards one common goal of a quantifiable disclosure regime where i will be able to evaluate a b c or z company depending upon their field of operation in a standard manner today our biggest problem is that one the model that i have for evaluation the model that sustainalytics may be having model that msci may be having model that another company may be having are very subjective model i am admitting that because of two reasons one there is no uniformity of disclosure the second is that not only the disclosure is not uniform company to company they are not uniform from year to year so today one company is disclosing in one manner another year they will be disclosing in different manner so there is i i would say there is a all brownian motion in the disclosure unless until it becomes channelized it will be very difficult having said that i can't say that there is no possibility of evaluation so we are still evaluating given that and if you look at india there is a brr is mandatory but iirc or gri or sustainability reporting is voluntary as mr singh has said that brsr is going to be voluntary from 2022 and mandatory from 2023 so if i look at the slate today out of the top 100 company only 60% are doing either a integrated reporting or gri reporting or sustainability reporting so our evaluation if you say the good evaluation is limited only to that and if i can give you some data we have a model where we have got 315 questions 1200 plus parameters and 2200 data points for each company so our analysis done that and if i we had recently done a scoring for 100 top companies in the listed space and we found that the esg scores were varied widely the lowest was 40 the highest was 80 and the average was 63 so you can see that what is the bandwidth that is there and the best score was in the policy because what has happened policy is disclosure is very easy that i have a policy that i will never do this thing but what is the performance nobody bothers so policy disclosure all across were fantastic the average was 83 and the best score was 99 the second best was the governance where the average score was 75 the reason is the companies act and sebi lodr have been hammering company for disclosure so there was a regulatory danda so everything was good but when you come to environment and social the lowest was 7 in environment which was very poor average was 48 and in social the lowest was 35 average was 58 so what we say it is there but i come back to your first thing when you said milton friedman said that the profit is the motive and i would say it will always remain what people are going for sustainability and environment is not because that they love environment or something they know very well that if they don't care for it tomorrow their investment might become zero so in order for their investment not becoming zero they are all loving environment social and governance parameter and the biggest challenge that we have 
is that you can put all things into disclosure and something, but you can't put ethics. And I recall one of the major questions that we asked in one of our report, where we found that a college principal was on the board of liquor company. And we raised an issue, is it ethical for a college principal to be on the board of a liquor company because there is a conflict of interest. In a liquor company board, I will do everything possible to increase my sales. Whereas when a student comes to ask me in a college, should I drink? I would, I can't say that you go and drink five bottles of liquor every week or something like this. So there is a conflict. Now, no law can capture this. It has to come from within. So all ESG reporting, other example I will give you, a question is asked whether Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, which makes bomber aircraft, is a good business or a bad business. Now, if you look from one perspective, it is a very bad business because you are manufacturing bomber aircraft. But on the other hand, if they are not manufacturing bomber here, it will not be acting deterrent to enemy, so they will bomb your country. So in order to stop the enemy from bombing your country, you have to have a bomber. So this type of debate will always be perpetual. I think I will stop here and we will discuss it further. Thanks, Mr. Gupta. Thanks for giving us that extremely important insight as to where do companies really fare on the various parameters and very well put that it is not that companies necessarily care for the environment, social governance. It is about profit. But I think the narrative is perhaps shifting from profit to with the purpose. And as sort of both of us sort of laid out in our opening remarks that the world is watching and we, not, we cannot necessarily ignore that voices anymore. Uh, Mr. Singh spoke about the greenwashing concern and how our index really is taking care of it. He spoke about the fact that we are so comprehensive, we are quantifiable, we have raised the bar. And some questions on ethics will keep coming from time to time. These are more subjective. I think it's a good idea to get Mr. Shroff in, just given you mentioned that on the policy front, we have fared so well. Mr. Shaw, very interesting conversation so far, getting opening remarks from both the gentlemen. I think it's good to sort of get you on board, to really put into perspective. I mean, we have Section 166 of the Companies Act 2013 for the protection of stakeholders or the primacy of company, which is for the fiduciary duties of directors, such as the duty to act in good faith, the duty to act in the best interest of the company, its employees, the shareholders, and the community, and the protection of the environment. According to you, how effective has this legal framework really been and what mechanisms do you see viable for its enforcement? What is the playbook for accelerating ESG in India? Still you're on mute. Sorry. Th thanks, thanks, Shija. Uh, very enjoyable comments from Amarjeet uh, and uh, Mr. Gupta. Uh, and uh, if I can say so, as a practitioner, I think the ESG genie is sort of out of the bottle now. Uh, and it is uh, well and truly kind of pervading uh, not only the policy world, but uh, also uh, the business world. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, corporate America or corporate Europe or corporate India, this is uh, now no longer just a compliance issue. It has become a mainstream strategy issue. And uh, I think all corporations and all private businesses are now looking at it from a very different lens of, uh, uh, of the future, not only from the point of view of just meeting a regulatory requirement, but how this kind of opens up opportunities as well. And this, there is almost a perfect storm just now with the regulators now coming up with requirements uh, for, uh, requirements for disclosure and compliance. I think the public markets, uh, particularly those which are kind of, uh, you know, where uh, index funds like BlackRock and State Street and others, they are playing a big uh, role as well. I think there is a lot happening in the uh, world of uh, of debt and uh, debt finance as well. The, uh, <clears throat> the central banks are driving green initiatives uh, as well. Also in uh, consumer markets as well, I think customers are now asking about you know, how is your ESG score before they buy your product? Employees are asking. There was a, there was a recent study, I think about a year ago, 
uh, from one of the big four in terms of the you know employee uh, coverage as well in, in terms of you know asking young recruits of you know what are some of the criteria that they look into when they join a, a company or they take up employment and uh, ESG is uh, is probably the topmost now almost 33 to 34 percent of the employees uh, of the the people who are joining and taking up jobs said they look at the kind of uh, ESG profile uh, of their uh, of their future employees so the the world has uh, world has changed and there is a, a lot that uh, is going to happen even going forward. So interesting that we are having this conversation just in the wake of uh, COP26. But, uh, and also we are having this conversation in the wake of what is happening in the Delhi pollution as well, where we are seeing the amount of intense uh, you know, environmental uh, uh, degradation uh, that is taking place. Now, if I kind of turn, uh, turn to India, I think we have a unique opportunity ahead of us. Uh, we have an opportunity because we're starting at a kind of a different base of by using new technologies to leapfrog. India has the opportunity of becoming one of the largest solar players in the world and other forms of you know, renewable uh, energies as well. So uh, whilst we have our own challenges because of, uh, you know, we are a large uh, developing country, uh, we'll always face issues and that, you know, straight away migrating from fossil fuels to uh, to renewables but at the same time the opportunity is uh, is massive as well let me come to your question now on the purpose of a corporation in section 166 so it's very interesting that you know apart from what sebi has been doing with things like brsr and others that the judiciary is also has taken note there was a recent supreme court judgment in april uh, 21 uh, where uh, yeah, section 166 was interpreted really for the first time and the uh, it kind of completely put paid to the uh, the Friedmanian uh, you know concept of that corporations work the primary purpose of corporation is to work for profit and well six, section 166 also talks of uh, employees and the community what the Supreme Court has said, uh, is that all these obligations are on a par. You can't single out and say only shareholders uh, uh, is in primacy. So then it becomes a factual interpretation uh, case by case uh, in terms of, you know, what when a, when a board takes, and this is a board responsibility, when a board takes responsibility and takes a decision, it can't say, no, no, I was looking after the shareholders and I could conveniently forget about the environment. So the board will be held accountable uh, even from the point of, from a broader perspective of ESG, which includes environment and community. I think there is going to be one big challenge, and I think this challenge is going to be faced uh, by various agencies, including by SEBI, uh, which is how are you going to enforce all of this? You know, 166 is a wonderful regulation or uh, legislation. BRSR is a wonderful, uh, you know, initiative moving in the right direction. So part of the challenge which the both the legal uh, as well as the policy world is going to face is how do you enforce this? How are you going to make boards accountable uh, from the point of view of, you know, this uh, this new paradigm, uh, which new paradigm is actually I'm, I'm using it consciously because that was the formal kind of discarding of the Miltonian uh, you know, doctrine. Uh, and this was uh, at, at Davos uh, five or six years ago. So that is one part. Uh, now coming to purpose of the corporation, which was another part of your question. Uh, I mean, and I'm looking at it again slightly differently from just the section 166 uh, con uh, sort of context. So the uh, part of the theory of a corporate, why were corporations created in the first place as a legal invention more than 250 years ago? It was essentially based on a license to operate that was given by the state. When the first few four corporations were formed, it was based on the theory that the state gave you a license. Okay, you operate a bridge, operate a hospital, operate a airport, operate a waterworks or whatever it is. So society gave you a license to operate uh, for a particular function with the implicit promise that you will work for the benefit of society. Somewhere down the line that uh, because of the nature of a joint stock, corporation with limited liability, that concept got abandoned and got substituted by the shareholder primacy concept. In its own way, we kind of come back to now the license to operate theory where 
you say you operate broadly on a license from society itself to operate but now with one difference is uh, if you go th- fully by the fiction of license to operate it has a kind of an extractive element to it where there's something which society has to give you and it licenses you to kind of take away from it almost like a you know mineral extracting license uh, where you can draw from society because of a particular purpose the way it is now moving that the conversations globally are moving is that you are now no longer in that kind of parasitic relationship with uh, with society but you are actually part of society itself so private sector corporate india corporate america whatever it is is now no longer separate from society in terms of having just a license to operate for a particular purpose but it is integral to society itself and must work for its benefit so actually 166 is making a lot of sense now uh, i'm not sure necessarily that all that was thought of when it was enacted but as we are seeing its practical uh, applications now in today's world uh, it uh, i think it is making a lot of sense but we still have to solve this uh, enforcement problem thanks for that mr shaw friends it was very beautifully laid out you know it is a perfect storm like conditions what we are seeing across the globe the capital markets tech markets accelerators for esg system but very important question posed by mr shaw fair and perhaps mr singh you could address that that it is a beautiful piece of regulation that we have now in the form of brsr we really talked about makes it all the more accountable very very well documented but how do you really get on to enforcement how do you actually board how do you make the boards more accountable for this perhaps a quick take from you and then just take the conversation forward amar ji got mute am i audible now yeah yeah okay 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 no 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 thanks for asking this uh, this question so uh, so you know uh, let me just uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the existing legislative framework in terms of section 166 uh, let me also mention that sebi nodr also echoes the similar expectations from board of directors and uh, um, even the uh, schedule 4 uh, of the uh, companies act also talks about board for independent directors and so on uh in fact if you go back to quota committee recommendations so there uh, it had noted that corporate india needs to move to a custodian model on the gandhian principles uh, where by you know promoters management and the board they wear the hat of the trustee and they rise above self interest so the vision has been laid down very well in our uh, legislative intent but my problem is we are miles away from you know when it comes to enforcement and let me elaborate that what i mean by that you have a high level legislative intent on one hand but you don't have the you know the uh, uh, subsequent frameworks that you need to have for example um, you know uh, even today the uh, the Uh, incentive structure which plays out in the companies right it is all financial the stock market prices they also are linked to the quarterly performance on the financial parameters not on the esg parameters right so all these frameworks the ceo's uh, incentive structure is aligned with the profit that you generate right we don't know although we have section 166 lays out those high level expectations but we don't really know whether the companies have a structured uh, process uh, you know where the or discussions in the board room where they discuss esg issues so what i'm trying to say the the legislative intent is one part but the lower level spinning out of uh, the the laws in granular details that is yet to happen and that will probably evolve over time again there would be a question whether sebi does it or other respective regulators lays out those laws you know in terms of various requirements on esg that different components there so uh, um, but let me also mention one more point the debate today is not stakeholder versus shareholder i think probably everybody is expecting as mr gupta 
uh, Mr. Shroff also mentioned that uh, the some of the institutional shareholders like BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, and so on, they are themselves uh, asking for uh, the you know the the stakeholder uh, protection. They are themselves saying we'll involve, not invest in those companies where the ESG concerns are ignored. So uh, I think we probably the the uh, over the last uh, ten years and especially in the last two years we've reached a point where there is an agreement that the purpose of the corporation is to do more than just make profits, but the necessary legislative framework at various levels are yet to evolve. The, the whole uh, thing in practice is yet to unfold. That's what I would say. So we are, you know, a little away from the enforcement issues. Time for that, Mr. Singh. Yes. Just, yes, Mr. Shah. Yes. So, you know, I think what uh, Amarjit said uh, is one part of it, namely the market will punish those who are uh, not, uh, you know, adopting ESG as part of their strategy, whether it's the Black Rocks or whether it's debt finance, all of that is one part. But I think there will, because we are also regulating and creating new policies, uh, the enforcement part will have to be uh, sort of there in black and white at some stage. And my suspicion is that we are one judgment away from the courts uh, sort of enforcing this. So even if you see this last Supreme Court judgment that I talked about, I think it has set the stage for uh, class actions. Uh, and that is that is one part where, and this that works a lot in the West, where class actions are probably the thing that boards are most afraid of. Now, class action suits haven't worked in India because just of the kind of inefficiencies and delays in our system. But that is one uh, one direction from which I see uh, enforcement coming. But of course, that should not be any excuse for uh, regulators not having a... So if SEBI formulates a BRSR, it must necessarily mean that there has to be a penalty at the end of it. So if somebody makes a wrong disclosure in BRSR, other people will write anything. How are you going to go after them? Will you treat it like a prospectus? Uh, and, and like, so, will you treat it on the same basis as a misdisclosure in a prospectus? So, so if I could step in quickly. Yeah, sure, uh, yeah, so, yeah. so, no, no, I should have such added this. Such a lovely this conversation. And... Wow, it is such a lovely and meaningful and organic conversation. Yes, I love it. <laughs> yes, Mr. Singh, you're making so, a point. So Response thanks, to thanks. Mr. Shaw. Uh, yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Actually, I should have said this about BRSR. Now, BRSR, see, I'll tell you what our priorities are. First of all, we are um, doing a paradigm shift from BRR to BRSR. So we are um, doing a lot of outreach. We are creating awareness. BRSR has, you know, over the last few months become a well-known acronym, if I can say, having sat in several discussions. So first, we want the acceptability of this framework and uh, people should start using it. Then once it becomes mandatory, you are absolutely right. If there is a non-disclosure or a wrong disclosure, if it is proved that what you said, even the goals that you set in BRSR and you gave some misleading picture, the company will be, you know, uh, will be subject to the enforcement action from SEBI because this will be a part of our LODR requirement, which, uh, which is enforceable. So what I gather uh, is that right now we are at the awareness stage, the acceptability uh, stage. Perhaps the penalty and the enforcement stage is something where the laws or the regulatory framework needs to evolve. Uh, that is the central that. sort of messaging that's coming across. So it's already been put in place. Uh, only thing is the question of time. Once it becomes, uh, once it becomes applicable on a mandatory basis, that is from the next financial year, then you have no choice but to disclose. And if you don't disclose, you will be faced with action. Okay. Yes, Mr. Gupta, you had a point to make. We'll get on Mr. Shroff. Yes. yes, I would say I would like to revise the definition for the purpose of the corporation. It should now read that the purpose of corporation should be the value creation or value addition and how to distribute that value between all the stakeholders. I think that is the thing where we should be moving. The other thing that Cyril and Amarjit are saying, the section 166 and BRSR as everything, to me, it is like that you are offering me sweet on a virtual world, which I cannot eat. So we got to transfer the sweet from the virtual world to the real world 
where I can get the benefit of 166 and everything transformed to the stakeholders. So rather than what is happening in the legislation and everything, with, because every legislation is created with a good intent, but the fruits of that legislation have to come to the real world. And that is the challenge and it is the challenge today and it may be remaining a challenge for a long time to come. I have a question but, for you, Mr. Shroff. Yeah, yes, no, and Amarji, I think let's uh, we are let taking Amarji the go first. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Singh, you want to say something? Quick point. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Again, uh, you know, it's a it's such an interesting discussion, and one can't keep away from talking about it. No, on the purpose, you know. So, so what Mr. Gupta said, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that. If you look at you know words, uh, uh, some of the big corporations, and I actually pulled out some. Uh, some like Google, what is the purpose? Purpose is to organize the world's information. Uh, look at Netflix, the purpose is entertaining the world. Look at uh, uh, Apple, uh, empowered creative exploration and self expression. Tesla, we exist to accelerate the planet's transition to sustainable transport. And you know, if you do a little bit more, this is not saying we want to grow at this. Uh, percentage or uh, this is the number of customers we want. It's not those financial matrix they're talking about. They're talking about purpose, uh, the which will lead to profits. Profit will be a byproduct of pursuing this purpose. Let me put it that way. And if you do a little bit, you know, dig deeper into their strategy, it is not just some high level English or some high level words that they've used. The challenge of the boards in these companies is to you know, convert these purposes, these high-level statements into a actionable strategy and make it a part of the DNA of the organization at all levels. So it goes beyond. And when you are working with such companies, you are not having your targets in mind. Those financial performance will be a byproduct of pursuing this high-level purpose. Thanks, Mr. Singh, to sort of bring that in. You spoke about companies like Google and Netflix and Tesla. So essentially, we're talking about organizations and startups and technology companies who are building the industries of the future. In India, we have literally become a unicorn churning machine, also given on the basis of this very benign liquidity environment. People all across the board, and you also mentioned, seem to be really valuing being overawed and actually completely and completely celebrating the financial metrics. One unicorn listing, $10 billion number, $11 billion number. So where is this entire conversation about stakeholder metrics or stakeholder parameters there? It is not there. You spoke about the purpose, but the fact is that from your investors to VCs to entrepreneurs, everybody's chasing that next unicorn number. So how does this entire ESG framework come into the picture when you're really building the industries of the future? Forget no, what I, the BlackRock and the vanguards of the world will do. They will punish or they will sort of really be actionable in public market side. But when you're building a large, sustainable, anti-fragile industry of the future, how important is the ESG in the mind of a startup entrepreneur who is always afraid that my competitor is not funded by a soft bank or Tiger Global. ESG perhaps is not going to stop up his mind. Perhaps quick question for you, Mr. Singh, and then to Mr. Shroff. Yes. So I, I beg to differ there. You know, uh, maybe unicorn, becoming a unicorn happens in the journey of a startup, you know, but when they are starting, so they are, what are they starting with? And they are starting with, uh, they, they start with a problem statement, you know, at uh, what is the problem that I can solve, right? And uh, they are not starting with that, I have to become a unicorn or I have to become profitable from day one. That is the reason you see companies run into losses. And as Cyril said, a lot of youngsters, you know, my son who works with a multinational, he wants to join a company and he wants to take a pay cut. He says, I'm not happy with the multinational. I want to work with a company which is more purposeful. And I didn't expect this from him. But, you know, younger generation, today's millennials are having a different set of uh, parameters in mind. So to start with uh, the typical, the way, the, 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 the way I see startups come up is they pick up a problem statement, problem statement at the society's level, and they see how technology can resolve those problems. And how then the 
financial intellectual capital today has become more important than the financial capital financial capital simply follows if you have a great idea of course out of 500 ideas maybe 450 ideas get rejected by the pe investors but that's the part of the game so i think esc concerns especially at the younger generation with the younger generation they are very very important you call them sustainability esc purpose more than profit all these considerations are very much ingrained today I wanted to bring bring you in, Mr. Shrab. Do you really see this really playing out for industries of the future? Really building out a new generation companies, uh, who perhaps in the face of it get more lured by the financial metrics or the financial hurdles than necessarily the ESG conversation. Yes. Yeah. So if I can, I, I think Amarjit put it beautifully that uh, all these uh, companies whom you are seeing list today at uh, you know multi billion dollar valuations, they all started off. with a core idea which was about solving a problem whether it was about making uh, the people of the world look beautiful whether it is about uh, uh, you know access to insurance whether it is about access to financial inclusion and digitizing uh, you know the uh, digitizing the financial economy each of these are a noble and interesting ideas which are required for society to move forward and whether the the founder themselves thought of it in purpose terms or not if we step back and look at it just now there is a purpose there is a purpose and there is a purpose which can be put eloquently now just like apple and netflix and and google and others we can we can use english to reduce it to five words for each of these companies that have been listed in the last uh, you know two months or so uh, so there is a purpose and the founder when they created when that idea was in sort of uh, invented in a garage uh, that is what was there in those uh, those brilliant uh, brilliant minds so this is one part now coming to esg so my impression is that uh, esg as a conscious idea is probably not what is driving them at this point of time but now i sort of shift gear and come back to sebi and amarjeet from a disclosure point of view so we have this wonderful brsr uh, which is there for listed companies but why are we not uh, you know applying the same standard at the stage of listing itself so uh, they when your offer document comes uh, when your offer document is being reviewed and you are giving your comments and you are sort of clearing the path for listing i think we should be applying a kind of a esg slash brsr mindset at that stage itself yeah i know that first april is when it starts kicking in and all of that but for full backward integration of this uh, disclosure regime you will have to come to the point where uh, it it becomes applicable at listing stage at this stage when offer documents are prepared or when offer documents are being reviewed by you it's a very light touch topic i think you will have to very very quickly literally very very quickly you will have to bring in this whole esg brsr mindset at the offer document stage itself नहीं तो फिर वो हाथी निकल गया फिर बाद में यू नो इट्स यू विल बी यू नो वरिंग अबाउट इट एट अ लेटर स्टेज द पॉइंट एट विच यू नीड टू प्रेस द मैसेज होम इज एट लिस्टिंग इट सेल्फ बिकॉज वन स्पोक फिर डी एन ए में बैठ जाएगा देन यू नो द न्यू बॉर्ड द न्यू कंपनी विल विल माइंड इट एंड आई नो फॉर अ फैक्ट बिकॉज वी बीन इन्वॉल्व इन ऑल दीज ऑफरिंग दैट वेज दे वंडरफुल कंपनी ग्रेट बिजनेस ऑल ऑफ दैट एंड आई थिंक दे विल ऑल डू वेल but uh, esg is not top of their mind just now which could have been had you plug out the danda at this stage itself at listing stage yeah that's sort of what i meant that esg not necessarily is a conscious idea for some of these companies and perhaps mr singh it's a great suggestion coming your way that why don't you embed this at the listing stage itself any thoughts in that direction yes yeah no that's uh, that's a great suggestion but let me also mention that uh, brsr is uh, applicable for top 1000 companies by market cap and uh, any company which is getting listed today if it is a part of those top 1000 uh, companies it has no option but to make disclosures uh, beginning next financial year so it's only a question of whether we should insist those disclosures in the interim before you Uh, get to the you know given timeline and perhaps uh, insisting it today when the timeline has not kicked in may not be correct 
so uh, probably this question will become more relevant when the, when we pass that uh, timeline and 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 uh, uh, let me also mention brsr will be a very comprehensive disclosure piece uh, is a very comprehensive disclosure piece so whether we want all of it at the time of ipo uh, one needs to consider that secondly secondly even today when we are since i've been involved in in this work given in ipo clearances etc uh, we are wherever we are finding a company a sifsa energy company or you know any company which could be uh, sensitive from the climate perspective we are asking some critical questions as a part of our observation and we are seeking those disclosures but i take the point i think we need to probably think about it as we get closer to the date of mandatory implementation i'll send okay, you let's time to take we are yeah. thinking about it amajit uh, i think uh, this would be a great reform and uh, well, you know as they say well, you don't have to wait till they become adult so bachpan se hi adat dal <laughs> Yeah, catch them in there, young. But I think now it's time to take the conversation forward. We spoke about the debt markets, capital markets, industries of the future, starting with purpose, Section One Sixty Six, and what a lovely conversation till now. Now it's time to really talk about uh, this entire idea that perhaps one sees a disproportionate focus on environment in the E in the E S G that is spelled out. Perhaps it is time to also move to the centering to more S and G. I wonder, Mr. Shrav, what are your ideas on this? And then get to Mr. Gupta and Mr. Singh. Yes. So let uh, Amarjit go first, and then I'll add. <laughs> You're passing mm-hmm. the ball clearly to him. Yeah. <laughs> so regulator, co respect the na chahiye. No, I think that's a great question. So you are right. In fact, when we were uh, working on this. so most of the input that we got especially when we were con- having conversations uh, with our you know global uh, standard setters uh, it was most of it was on climate uh, but we have you know very consciously kept our ground realities in mind so what i like to call it is we followed a climate plus approach it is not just climate related disclosures and it's a climate plus approach and what i mean by that is if you look at some of the you know data let's say data on human development index we rank 131 among 189 countries this is a 2020 human development index and that is a measure of uh, health education and you know the standard of living if you look at another data point that is the inclusive development index of the world economic forum so we are at the 62nd place among 74 emerging economies so you know clearly on the the social disparities income in inequalities they are very huge in our country so we couldn't have missed that piece so as a result you know we've been very very conscious and mindful of not just focusing on disclosure and uh, also having the quantitative social metrics and just to give you some examples like uh, diversity of the workforce health and safety of employees uh, employee engagement and welfare measures uh, how a company is utilizing its csr uh, you know uh, whether it is going to the aspirational districts or not who are the beneficiaries uh how are the marginalized uh, groups of the society getting benefited and so on so there's a host of disclosures there i just pause with that okay yeah, mr shroff any ideas in that regard yeah no absolutely and i think uh, amarjit put it uh, very well but there is a, i think another dimension to uh, what we're seeing in uh, you know how the market is developing which is that a lot of these tech companies Uh, and it's across the board uh, are also in the gig economy where there is not enough protection for uh, for for the employee uh, workforce uh, so you know I, the way if i just take it in kind of decades uh, the la- sort of last one and a half decades was mostly about g as an enabler kumar mangalam birla narayan murthy kotak all these kind of took the the g conversation up to a particular level now we are in a good place plus 2013 companies and 
last two three years we have seen the environmental thing being ratcheted up quite a lot because of you know uh, not only all the global conversation on climate uh, but also the i think the pandemic kind of accelerated that this s wo piche reh gaya hai uh i think we need to uh, and particularly in a country of you know 1.4 billion people uh, uh s is more important to us than it is to a country of 100 million or 200 million or 300 million so i think there needs to be a little bit of rebalancing of priorities and there are so many uh, issues that are part of s whether it's mental health whether it is you know what are the labor codes that will apply on the one hand are you know hr ministry is going in the other direction of simplifying the layer code and taking away protection but on the other hand millions of people are joining your uh, gig economy with no protection at all so uh, i i don't know who can fix it whether it is uh, public markets that are going to fix it or whether it is separate social legislation that is going to fix it but it is uh, it is a problem and what you will find after some time is that uh, g has gone to you know international levels e will catch up in the pace that you know the international agreements and forums will allow it to but it would be quite a tragedy that if in a country of so many people s is uh, languishing like to third world yeah. standards yeah that's a good suggestion for you uh, mr singh here that s should not end up as a laggard in the world where perhaps we have uh, g reaching international standards and e perhaps would play a catch up yeah mr gupta you have been to say something for a while and then we'll get to mr singh yes yeah. okay see i would say <coughs> that let us not look esg as a rigid framework it's not a one size fits all because there will be industry will be different industry to industry there could be industry which are very much centric towards the employees or social thing there could be some industry which are very specific to environment so if you look at sasb old sasb not the new one they have got 77 different standards where they have given where are the risk lying and what should be the weightage so even in ses when we are doing evaluation we change the weightage of esg depending upon the industry when we are evaluating banks we make more focus on the s factor rather than e or g factor so we do this tweaking in <clears throat> but one thing i would agree that legislation wise we are very much behind in the s factor because till now it is of the no one's baby the government is doing legislation but it is not doing legislation respect to the company disclosure the company policy sebi is focusing on the g and now it is coming on esg activity but i would say that going forward the s factor is going to be as important as the environment factor because unless until you take care of the society that things we are going to be very difficult as you have seen in one of the case in india one of the company plant had to be shut down because the local community was not happy with that so such cases if they going to increase in future it will be very disastrous for the industry so i think there has to be a balance between e and s and g it can't be that one part of the body will be healthy other part of the body can't be healthy so going forward everything will be placed properly and industry wise there will be standard for e and s g can i add okay, i think it's so i i yeah. don't see these as three separate concepts and while they are interconnected g has a very another very interesting uh, facet to it is that g can actually enable e and s yeah. because g affects the board g affects the management and g affects how the company is governed so if you sort it at the governance level then automatically you know the company will look after both environment and social so you have and i think sebi is doing that it is its basic approach is that it is treating g as the enabler of ens i think it's time to take sort of the conversation forward we spoke about quite a few thing but let's just to talk about the operational aspects and the practical aspects of it from an investor's point of view definitely there's a lot of good associated with this entire esg narrative 
but what really are the costs involved in terms of uh, really making it sustainable do you think it is sustainable even post the pandemic i mean it's already hard enough to optimize profits for shareholders how easy would op- operationalizing of optimizing multiple stakeholders be in the long run is something like esg conversation here to stay or is it a fad i begin with you mr singh and then going to mr shroff yeah before i answer that if you permit i'll just like to go back to the previous sure. uh, topic sure. uh, very quickly actually i think the socio economic challenge is really huge uh, to state the obvious in our country and i think all of us have to do our bit so as a regulator i'll just give you one example of course brsr we've talked about but another piece that we just uh, recently finished rewriting is the regulations relating to employee stock benefit uh, schemes so there very consciously we've left the definition of employees to the company you define if you want to include your gig workers uh, you know for uh, rewarding them uh, you you are free to do that and we kept that especially uh, keeping the interest of gig economy workers in mind so i thought i'll just add that now on the costs uh, related aspect i really don't have much to say obviously see there are uh, certain risks which are there uh, both for the companies uh, and uh, investors but talking mainly from the company's point of view you have a transition risk and there would be cost attached to it you know if you are moving from if there's a technological shift uh, you know which is required in your company to to become more climate friendly and so on uh, there would be huge cost but that as uh, uh, mr shroff mentioned earlier there are also opportunities so uh, i think that each company has to work out its own cost benefit matrix and but probably the the way forward is clear uh, you have to move in that direction mr shroff any thoughts in this direction the cost and the opportunity of transition for existing businesses and invest a premium for cleaner better governed businesses so i think it'll vary sector by sector but uh, those uh, sectors whether it's um, you know power generation using uh, fossil fuels or uh, cement or construction i think they are going to have a tougher time because it's much more clunky and they have to move to a completely different set of technology so that and that whole sector is going to require much more clean capital uh, but there are other industries which should be able to move uh, much faster i think uh, you know those which are largely tech based to start with they will be able to make their own transition quite quickly but i think they will have another issue because they also re- rely on a supply chain uh, and if uh, even the brsr standards expect you to also make disclosures about your supply chain so how they are going to get the supply chain to comply with uh, these expectations is going to be another ball game so I, you know i think the whole world recognizes and even the spirit of cop 26 was that it's not easy you know companies talk about 2030 2050 and we talked about 2070 uh, so we know that it is a multi decade uh, process but so long as you are able to get some quick hits uh and uh, and move along the journey that is probably the best that we can do so india by 2030 is aiming to sort of achieve half its goal which is not bad i think we are aiming towards the end of the conversation here we don't have sort of much time left but i think it would be a good idea to put all of this into perspective and really try to understand one thing is that at a time when investors are really pressing hard for companies to be more and more esg compliant if you look at the private market space pe investors are very clear in fact the lps the, the fund which invest into pe funds have in their chartered document to very very clearly laid out that you have to invest in esg compliant companies at a time like this when the noise or the conversation on esg is gaining so much traction there could be temptations to position yourself as an esg company there could be greenwashing seen at various levels and hidden greenwashing so my question to this august panel really is that you know when you have temptations to greenwash and how do you sort of really safeguard interest in that regard how do you really see to it that this entire effort is not necessarily 
rat hole into becoming a PR exercise or a marketing exercise from organizations? And how do we make sure that does not really happen? Uh, so one is the enforcement bucket by the SEBI and the other is by temptations by corporations and perhaps an incestual set of corporations, what we have seen the crony capitalism being played out to really not take advantage of greenwashing. Uh, over to you, Mr. Singh, then to Mr. Shroff and then to Mr. Gupta. Yes. Uh, so I think, as I said earlier, our concerns are largely twofold. One is disclosure, and second is uh, checking against uh, mis-selling, you know, by way of greenwashing. So what we mean by greenwashing? So point is, if you are selling, just to give you an example, if you are selling an ESG scheme, if a mutual fund is selling an ESG scheme, is the ESG scheme true to its label? That is the issue, and. Uh, uh, you know the the we have recently come out with a discussion paper also for mutual funds on investing in ESG schemes. So I think for SEBI, I can say that we are looking at these concerns very very proactively. And by the way, I should also mention that in that paper we say that the mutual funds will be able to invest only uh, in as a part of their ESG schemes investment only in those companies which follow BRSR. So that's another push. Or BRSR, and that is that will kick in next year again, October 22. So the uh, that's the proposal for for you know in the consultation paper. ISCO also, I'm aware, has been working on these issues, and they have recently come out with their guidance on enforcement. But I think we all have to be very alert. Uh, it would be very sad if you know the uh, this. Uh, I hate to use the word the scam, but you know if if it becomes a sort of a scam in the name of ESG and investors burn their fingers. So from our side, we are trying to be proactive and taking close look at these concerns, and and as we go along, we'll we'll be addressing those. That's well said in the closing remarks. Really, that it would be sad to see all of this turning out to be a scam. Yeah, Mr. Shroff, your closing remarks on this. No, I think uh, Amarjeet uh, put it well, uh, and uh, you know, knowing the kind of you know broad spectrum of companies and uh, industries, uh, there will be good apples and bad apples. You are going to get all kinds of sheep. You know, all sheep are neither white nor all of them are black. So I think you will have to get. You will eventually deal with all uh, all sorts of players in the market. Where I think the test really will be how does the regulatory environment and market forces actually deal with it, because those initial examples once they are set will set the trend uh, for the others. So unless there is a strong penalty for greenwashing, uh, or or you know just misdisclosures, I think you know that might become the the sort of easy uh, no pun intended cop out of uh, uh, you know of how corporate sector uh, could deal with it. So I am not expecting perfect human behavior, nor am I expecting you know completely that the whole market is going to be malafide. You're going to get something in between, and the test will be uh, how uh, how it is actually dealt with. And I think those initial examples, uh, how they uh, they get resolved, will set the tone for the rest uh, of the journey. The, well the regulatory intent is very strong and uh, well intentioned. So, uh, you know, full power to uh, Amarjeet and uh, his organization. Absolutely. I think BSR definitely a right step in the direction. And, you know, sort of very well said that the initial set of, initial set of companies will set the tone for the in success of this entire piece. And the penalties have to be then a stricter ones for enforcement. Otherwise, there could be temptations for this to turn out to be a big scam. Uh, yes, Mr. Gupta, what are your closing remarks in this direction? I would say the first we were talking about the cost of compliance, etc. Now the industry or the corporations have to look. It is not a cost. It is an insurance for your survival. The way insurance is must. So your compliance with ESG should be there. Otherwise, you are not going to survive. As for the greenwashing, etc. is concerned, there are two aspects to it. One is this, as Cyril said, that you cannot avoid greenwashing at all because that whole world is not going to center to be a very good student or good child there will be always the case but you can always catch greenwashing by a third party evaluation because when you are rated when you are given a score based on your performance 
so that green watching will get sooner or later exposed the third aspect of it is this that today it is too early to say whether the esg fund performance is good or not for the simple reason what is happening today only 100 or 200 or 50 companies are compliant with the esg or the scores are good so if all the funds are entering into those companies automatically the price goes off goes on and keeps on increasing so your performance in terms of the net asset value is already there the real fact will be whether the esg funds are performing or not when the basket goes up and increases from 50 or 100 companies to 500 companies then only the real evaluation will happen otherwise today the evaluation that is happening is because a very small number of companies are changed by many big funds everybody is having an ESG fund and although the ESG funds are changing the 50 and 60 companies so that is the problem okay i think we've had such a meaningful discussion and such a lovely conversation today really which people might have thought that okay what a topic but really the topic is the heart of all boardroom conversations not what a power packed panel i think it's time to do some quick rapid fire here i think which we do it across all our panels i'll begin with you mr singh a company that you think has successfully been esg compliant since the start of the pandemic uh, as a regulator i'm not supposed to name companies <laughs> okay uh, one mistake you think enterprises are making in the transition to adopting stakeholder capitalism so you know my sense is that uh, uh, it should not just be a lip service uh, many of the companies i suspect may be doing lip service uh, it should translate into real action on the ground the future of profit in one line uh not great profit will be a byproduct of pursuing a high level purpose okay mr shroff i come to you a company that you think has successfully been esg compliant no, no, since I the start the of the pandemic i have the same answer as amarjit i'll never comment <laughs> on a company so one but, mistake uh, you mr gupta can comment because that he has a whole uh, system set up for that so question <laughs> deflected to him <laughs> okay, and one mistake you think enterprises are making in their transition to adopting stakeholder capitalism? So apart from the lip service point, which I agree with, I think uh, there is probably disproportionate effort being put on the E aspect. I think the whole S part is being lost in the shadows. So that the is one mistake which I see being made. And the future of profit in one sentence, what would that be according to you? I, I think it's early. It, it will evolve. The future of profits will uh, will change uh, uh, multiple times, but it is integrally being linked with uh, purpose and uh, ESG impact. ESG investing trend. One ESG investing trend which you think is here to stay even post COVID nineteen. I think technology businesses, technology oriented businesses. Okay, okay, Mr. Yeah, Gupta. I think that there's going to be a long run on that. Okay. And also, Mr. also, I think a lot of uh, what you would call old world companies will transform. At least some of the successful ones will transform themselves digitally. We'll see not completely. just new companies which come with you know starting off with technology, but some of the old company which you would never have thought. You know, some of the old elephants will dance also. The old elephants will dance and will become totally new age. That yes, people love yes. to see that totally because it's difficult to make the elephant dance. And now digital transformation in old age companies can prove to be so cumbersome. And we hear it from companies all the time. Yes, Mr. Gupta, everybody has passed the buck to you on this one. A company that you think has successfully been ESG compliant since the start of the pandemic. I think I have a choice of saying the same thing what Mr. Singh and Mr. <laughs> said, but I will not say. I would say it is a ESG scoring or rating is a very subjective thing. It depends from model to model. So I would say as per our model, we have found that Mahindra and Mahindra is doing very well as far as the ESG compliance is concerned. And some of the Tata Group companies are doing well. But Again, I would say it is subjective of the model. Maybe, okay. yeah. And the future of profit in one sentence, according to you? 
I think the future of profit is not going to change. The profit will remain where it is. The only thing is that, that allocation of profit to different factors will change. Now, more and more profit would have to be allocated to employees and the social causes. Because without taking care of your society, you are not going to go any forward anymore. Okay. My last question to you, Mr. Singh. What was the high point of this last 60 minutes of conversation we had today? What was the most interesting point which really got you thinking? I think I was on a high all through. So there's no particular point. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we had a very meaningful conversation, a topic which is the center of all boardroom conversations now. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Thank you, Mr. Singh. And thank you, Mr. Shroff for putting this all together. And thank you to all our audiences for being so patient. And thank you to, again, our panelists for putting the time and energy to this on a Monday evening. Till the time I see you next, goodbye and good luck. Thank you to everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.